Hello friends, my name is Cindy and I am one of the children's librarians at Portland Public Library in Portland, Maine. And today we're going to finish Who Was Leonardo da Vinci? And that is by Roberta Edwards and illustrated by True Kelly. Chapter four, moving on. Milan had a famous university, but it was not a center for famous artists like Florence was. But Ludovico Sforza was very interested in the arts. And here's a picture of Ludovico Sforza. The Duke liked to give big parties. He liked to put on pageants. He also wanted someone to design new weapons for him. The city-states were often at war with one another. All of this interested Leonardo. He wrote a letter to the Duke. In it, he listed everything he was good at. Some of it was bragging. He said he would design buildings and bridges, warships and huge cannons. Nobody knows if Leonardo ever sent the letter. There is also a story about a present that Leonardo gave the Duke. The Duke loved music. Leonardo did too, so he made a lute. This was like a violin with strings and a bow. It was made of silver and was in the shape of a horse's skull. It had to be played upside down. Whether this is true or not, one thing is certain. This Duke did eventually hire Leonardo. And here's a picture of the lute. So off Leonardo went to Milan. Whatever the Duke wanted, Leonardo would create. He worked for the Duke for many years until the Duke was forced from power. Here are some of the, here's one of the cannons that he designed. When the Duke's nephew was married, there was a huge feast. Leonardo was in charge of the party after the feast. He built incredible stage sets. There, there were, they were for a play known as the Feast of Paradise. What a spectacle it must have been. A mountain was split in two. Inside it was a beautiful model of the heavens. Actors in fancy costumes represented the different planets. The 12 signs of the zodiac were lit by torches. Everything turned around and round, and here is a picture of it. Some of Leonardo's work was much more practical. He found a better way to heat the water for the Duchess's bath. He also built a series of canals. Another project was something Leonardo worked on for years and was never able to finish. Even at the end of his life, he was still dreaming about his horse. The Duke wanted a giant statue of a horse. The statue was to honor the memory of his father. He didn't want it to just be big. He wanted it to be huge the biggest ever. For years, Leonardo made sketches of how the horse statue might look. He studied the horses in the Duke's stables. He made wax models. He even cut into the muscles and bones of dead horses. He wanted to know a horse inside and out. And here's a drawing of a horse's leg. Leonardo's horse was to be more than three times the size of a real horse. Its front right leg would be lifted. It would be made of bronze. 80 tons of metal were needed for a statue this big. After 10 years on the project, Leonardo finished a full-sized model of the horse in clay. It stood in the courtyard of the Duke's castle. It was 24 feet high. Now everyone in Milan came to see what the statue would look like, and they all agreed. There had never been anything like it. Here's a picture of the statue in the courtyard. But Leonardo still had much work ahead of him. He made molds from clay for the different parts of the statue. After that, hot bronze would be poured into the molds. This was going to be a very tricky process too. If the metal wasn't poured fast enough, it would crack as it grew hard. But Leonardo figured out how to avoid the cracking. The Duke collected all the metal that Leonardo needed. It really seemed as if the fabulous bronze statue would be made, but Leonardo never got to use the metal for his horse. By 1494, the Duke was afraid that soldiers from France were going to attack. What happened to all that bronze? The Duke made it into cannons. Even so, the cannons did not stop the French. They took over Milan in 1499, and here is a form for casting the horse's head. And what happened to Leonardo's giant clay horse? The French used it for target practice. They shot arrows into it until it was completely destroyed. There was nothing left of all those long years of work. Leonardo's dream turned into dust. 
It was not Leonardo's fault that the horse was never finished. However, another important job for the Duke also came to an unhappy end, and this time Leonardo was partly to blame. Near the Duke's castle was a monastery, a place where monks lived and prayed and studied. The Duke planned to be buried there one day. He wanted Leonardo to paint a picture on one of the walls in the dining hall. This kind of painting is called a fresco. The most beautiful kind of fresco is also the hardest kind of painting to do. Water-based paint is put directly onto fresh plaster that hasn't dried. In Italian, fresco means fresh. The artist must work quickly, and once the paint is brushed on, the artist can't go back and make changes. The dining hall in the monastery was a very large room. It was big enough for 50 monks to eat in. Leonardo decided to choose a scene from the end of Jesus' life. He and his 12 followers are shown at a dinner table. This was a good choice for a painting in a dining hall. It is a very dramatic moment. Jesus tells his followers that one of them is going to betray him. Leonardo made many drawings of ways to show 13 figures seated at a table. He wandered through the streets of Milan looking for people to put in his fresco. The fresco was to be painted on the wall so that it seemed to be part of the dining hall. It would be almost as if Jesus and his followers were in the same room with the monks. Even the table and the dishes in the painting were the same kind the monks used. This fresco is called the Last Supper and is one of the most famous works of art in the world. Gentlemen from Milan would travel to the monastery to watch Leonardo paint. He didn't mind. In fact, he liked to hear their opinions of the picture. And here is the picture. <coughs> A 17-year-old boy often came to watch, too. He grew up to be a writer and left accounts of the Last Supper. He wrote that sometimes Leonardo would come into the dining hall very early in the morning. He would paint the entire day from sunrise to sunset. He would not even stop to eat or drink. Then on other days, he would stand in front of the painting and scold himself. It wasn't good enough, and sometimes he would dash in from working on the horse statue. He would make one or two br brush strokes and then leave. In the fresco, Jesus is shown in the center with six men on either side of him. He looks very calm, but sad. The followers react to his news with horror. Each side seems to back away from him like a shock wave. One of the men, however, seems to be separated from the group. He is leaning forward, his arm on the table. His name is Judas, and he is the one who will betray him. This is Judas here. And here's a picture of him working. By 1497, the Last Supper was completed. It was so lifelike and dramatic. All over Italy, people talked about this beautiful, moving painting. Leonardo was known now as the greatest master of his day. Copies of the Last Supper were made by other artists. Engravings were made for people all over Europe to buy. 500 years later, it is still considered an, a work of genius. So why isn't this a happy ending? it's because of danger, I mean, damage to the painting. The Last Supper started to crack and peel less than 50 years after Leonardo, Leonardo, Leonardo finished it. It was Leonardo's fault. Leonardo didn't like working on frescoes the regular way. He wanted to be able to go back and make changes. So instead, he tried something new. He put varnish on the wall and then painted it with tempera paints. Leonardo was always experimenting. This was one experiment that was a big mistake. Today, much of the wall painting has flaked off. Many of the faces are only half there. The colors are faded. Experts have tried to restore the Last Supper. They have made improvements. Still, there is great damage to this masterpiece. It is probably lucky that Leonardo can't see how it looks. The Duke was a good patron to Leonardo for many years. He kept Leonardo very busy. He also let him take jobs from other rich people in Milan. It was in Milan that Leonardo took in a poor 10-year-old boy. The year was 1490. The boy's name was Giacomo, but Leonardo called him Salai. That was a slang word meaning rascal or demon. Salai was indeed a rascal. He lied. He broke things. He stole money from Leonardo and Leonardo's friends. In his notebook, Leonardo wrote that Salai ate as much as two boys and made as much trouble as four. And here's a picture of them. Even so, Leonardo was very fond of Salai. He enjoyed spoiling him with presents. No matter how badly Salai behaved, Leonardo never asked him to leave. 
Salai stayed with him for the rest of Leonardo's life. Whenever, wherever Leonardo traveled, Salai went too. He may have done chores for, Le for Leonardo, but he was very much more important to him than a servant. Leonardo was not close to many people. He enjoyed being alone, free to think. He never had a family of his own. Perhaps Salai was the one person who was almost like family. And there he is having broken something. Chapter five, wandering. In 1499, when the French attacked, the Duke lost his power. He fled Milan. Then later on, he was captured. He died a prisoner in France. In December of that year, Leonardo left Milan too. Salai went with him and there they are traveling. So did another old friend. Leonardo did not have a real home again for 16 years. He took very little with him as he traveled from place to place. Only the most important things did he keep with him, like his notebooks. For in Milan, he had started keeping notebooks full of drawings and ideas. Leonardo kept filling up notebooks for more than 30 years. His plan was to write an encyclopedia about everything. Here are a lot of his drawings. Like the horse statue, this was another great big project. And like the horse statue, it was a job he never completed. However, the notebooks are still priceless treasures. The pages are illustrated with beautiful drawings of everything that had interested Leonardo. They are among the most beautiful drawings in the world. There are probably were a total of about 13,000 notebook pages, but after his death, many pages were torn out and sold. Some notebooks were cut apart, some disappeared. Some were rediscovered hundreds of years later. Today, there are 10 different collections of Leonardo's notebook pages. Only half the pages, about 6,000 pages, are known to exist. They are in different places all over the world. There is always the hope that someday more notebook pages will turn up. And here are some more <coughs> pictures. Bill Gates, the founder of Microsoft, bought one collection of pages. It is all about water. It is called Codex Atlanticus. Sometimes it is displayed in museums. In it are drawings of waves and currents, drawings of ripples in water, drawings of a drop of water as it splashes into a puddle. Leonardo's eyes were so sharp, he could see all by himself what today's high-speed cameras can reveal. There are experiments that Leonardo did with water. In all the notebooks, his handwriting is reversed. This is called mirror writing, and this is what it looked like. A mirror must be held up to the writing before it reads correctly. Why did Leonardo write this way? Nobody knows. He was left-handed, so maybe writing this way came most easily to him. Or he may have wanted to make it hard for anybody else to read the pages. Maybe he worried that other people might steal his ideas. Maybe he just wanted to keep his ideas secret. Leonardo's interest in water went all the way back to his childhood from the storms he saw, but water was only one of the subjects he planned to cover in his encyclopedia. He wanted to understand and explain light. What was it made of? He wanted to understand how eyesight works, why birds can fly, and all the different parts of the human body. He came up with a list of about 20 big subjects. Just one page of a notebook might have little drawings of birds and feathers, along with thoughts about music and ideas for new weapons or sketches on building dams. Leonardo never stuck to one subject. He'd go back and forth among many, uh, many. The notebook pages are crammed with writing and beautiful drawings. It's almost as if whatever jumped into his mind, he put down on the page. What the notebooks reveal is the mind of a true genius. He wanted to invent vehicles for people to use on land, in the air, even underwater. Leonardo was sure that one day people would fly. He said, it lies within the power of man to make this instrument. And here are some of his drawings about that. Did Leonardo actually build any wings? Did anyone try them out? Nobody is sure. In the notebooks, he mentions testing the wings on a hill in Florence. If so, he may have jumped from the top of the hill and glided in the air for a little while, but he could not have flown. The wings would not have worked for more than one reason. First, they were way too heavy. Also, it takes a lot of force to lift a heavy object off the ground and keep it in the air. The force of human power wasn't strong enough, and in Leonardo's day, engines with strong power had not yet been invented. 
Of course, Leonardo was right. People did learn to make flying machines, but it didn't happen until December of 1903, and that is when the Wright brothers' airplane flew for 12 seconds. For a while, Leonardo worked for another duke in Italy. His name was Cesare Borgia. He was power hungry and bloodthirsty. Leonardo designed weapons for the duke's troops to use in battle. Leonardo did not believe in war and referred to it as a disease. Leonardo thought of the human body as a machine too. In fact, he considered it the most perfect machine. Leonardo wanted to understand the human body in the same way he came to understand horses, inside and out. He wanted to figure out how all the different parts of the body worked together. The best way to do this was to dissect bodies. This meant cutting into a dead body. Peeling back different layers reveals how the body is built. In Florence, he had a workshop in a hospital. He worked at night and he worked alone. The work was indeed disgusting. He hated it, but he did it anyway. The drawings were not discovered until long after Leonardo had died. And this was what some of them looked like. If the body was a machine, then it should be possible to build a mechanical man. <clears throat> in 1495, Leonardo built a design for the first robot. Is, um, there is evidence that he built it too. His robot was a full-sized knight in armor that could sit up, move its head, and wave its arms. Again, Leonardo was hundreds of years ahead of his time. Chapter 6, The Battle of the Artists. Leonardo, Michelangelo, and Raphael. Leonardo was one of the greatest artists of the Renaissance, but he was not alone. The Renaissance in Italy was such a special time because it produced so many talented artists. Besides Leonardo, the two other greatest names belong to Raphael and Michelangelo. Raphael was a great admirer of Leonardo's. Michelangelo was not. He didn't like Leonardo, and Leonardo didn't like him. It's hard to imagine two men who were more different. Michelangelo came from a well-off family, but didn't wash or change his clothes often. He slept on the floor of his studio. He was also short, had a crooked back, and a quick temper. Leonardo was handsome, well-dressed, neatly groomed, and charming. 27 years younger than Leonardo, Michelangelo had become famous for his huge statue of David. Leonardo didn't think the statue was all that great, or at least that's what he said. In turn, Michelangelo made fun of Leonardo in public for never finishing his huge statue. He said, you made a model of a horse you couldn't cast in bronze and which you gave up to your shame, and the people, stupid people of Milan had faith in you. When both men were asked to paint a wall in the main government building of Florence, it became a fierce contest. The walls were to picture different scenes from famous battles that Florence had won. Again, the paintings were to be frescoes, pictures painted directly onto the walls. The last time Leonardo had tried this was in the monastery for the Last Supper. The room was giant-sized, and Leonardo's fresco was to measure about 60 feet by 24 feet. He began making many drawings. He wanted a scene full of action, with horses rearing and soldiers fighting. The horror of war would come through too. The dead, the wounded howling in pain, the dust and dirt and blood. After Leonardo decided on the design, he made a cartoon which was transferred onto the wall. Then he set up a scaffold with a platform that could move. This would allow him to work in comfort. The trouble was, Leonardo still did not want to make a fresco in the usual way. Once again, he tried an experiment. He found a way to use oil paints with coal fires to make the paint dry quickly. He had tested out the experiment on a wall in his studio and it had worked, but the test was done on a small paint covered area. Leonardo needed it to work on great big areas and it didn't. If the fires were placed close to the painting, it melted. As for Michelangelo, he didn't finish his wall either. Maybe that was some comfort for Leonardo. In 1504, Michelangelo was called to Rome by the Pope to start other jobs. One was to paint the ceiling of the Pope's chapel. We know it as the Sistine Chapel. Chapter seven, Leonardo's ladies. 
Not everything in Leonardo's career ended in failure. Sometimes he actually finished a job. It is true that only 10 completed paintings are known to be by Leonardo. That's a tiny number, but each and every one is a treasure. The story is that in 1505, a rich silk merchant wanted a portrait of his wife. He asked Leonardo to paint it. Leonardo had told friends that he had grown weary of the paintbrush. He meant that painting didn't bring him much joy anymore, but perhaps he needed the money, or perhaps the woman's face caught his interest, especially her smile. Whatever the reason, Leonardo took the job and he finished the painting, though, although he worked on it for many years. Nobody knows for sure what the woman's name was. Her first name may have been Lisa. She may have been Lisa del Giacondo. In English, the painting is called the Mona Lisa. In the portrait, only the top half of Mona Lisa's body is shown. Behind her is a landscape. A winding road leads to a craggy mountain that disappears in mist. It is the expression on her face that draws people to her. Her lips are pressed together in a calm half smile. She looks as if she's keeping a secret. Her eyes are full of mystery too. They appear to look out at something only can sh she can see. And this is her at the Louvre, the museum in Paris. The Mona Lisa is probably the most famous painting in the world. Why? No one can really answer that question, but Leonardo loved that painting too. Chapter 8, Losses. In 1504, Leonardo's father, Ser Piero, died. He was 78 years old. There was no will, and Leonardo ended up receiving nothing. All the money went to Ser Piero's other children. Then in 1507, Leonardo's uncle Francesco died. He had been the only relative to show him any affection. Francesco did have a will. Everything was left to Leonardo. Francesco wanted Leonardo to have all his land and money, but Leonardo's half-brothers and sisters were furious. They went to court. What Leonardo ended up getting was the use of Francesco's land and money. After Leonardo died, it would all go to his relatives. Leonardo was almost 60. He had health problems. He had no home and not all that much to show for his many years of work. But at a time when he needed a patron, one appeared. The man appreciated Leonardo for the genius he was. He provided him with a lovely home and garden. He let Leonardo bring along Salai and his other good friend, Francesco Melzi. All the man asked of Leonardo was his company. The man also happened to be a king. King France, Francis I of France had a grand house in Amboise. That's in the northern part of France. Leonardo was given a beautiful brick and limestone house to live in. He brought along his book collections, his notebooks, and three of his paintings. One of them was the Mona Lisa. Here's a picture of the house. A tunnel connected the two houses. Each day he was in Amboise, the king would come to visit and talk. He would pick a subject and ask Leonardo his opinions. The king evidently felt it was an honor simply to be in Leonardo's presence. And so Leonardo finished out his life in France. On May 2nd, 1519, he died. One story says that he died in the king's arms. Another says that his last words were about his horse's statue. If only he had been able to complete it. He was buried in a chapel in Amboise. It may not be a happy ending, but it isn't a sad one either. Leonardo left his notebooks to his friend Melzi, who tried to organize them. All the pages on art were assembled and published as a book. It was called Treatise on Painting. A treatise explains a person's ideas on a subject, so this book explains Leonardo's ideas about painting. For some reason, the book wasn't published until 1651, more than 130 years after Leonardo's death. The rest of the notebook pages remained unknown to the world for far longer. The sheets that weren't lost or stolen were cut apart, were, didn't come to light until the early 1800s. The most recent ones were found in 1965. They turned up in Madrid in the stacks of the National Library. And that was Who Was Leonardo da Vinci? I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did reading it. My name is Cindy. I am one of the children's librarians from Portland Public Library in Portland, Maine. And I hope you'll come back and visit us again soon. Bye-bye, friends.